Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's CC webinar live keynote and panel discussion session. And thank you for joining. We would also like to thank GTT team for sponsoring today's session. And now I would like to pass on the microphone to Eric to introduce the speakers of today and later on to moderate the session. For audience, please do use the chat box option throughout the session. If you have any questions to our speakers, good luck. And that's all from my side. Over to you, Eric. Thank you very much, Laura, and a uh, warm welcome to everybody out there and uh, watching and listening to us, because stay tuned, because it will be a very interesting uh, webinar, which is actually sponsored by GTT. And today's topic, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, how to improve your IP traffic performance and security. So we're going to talk about the key trends, the challenges, and the strategies. My name is Eric van Stockman. I'm an ambassador for, for Carry Community. And um, in, in the today's um, uh, uh, Global Carrier Community Webinar, you will gain insight into the latest trends into global internet traffic management and security. In addition to presenting the latest global traffic statistics at the industry level, the webinar will address the role of tier one peering arrange, arrangements and how the largest ISPs have been coordinating during the pandemic to ensure that the global internet operates with sufficient capacity to meet the increasing traffic demands. Additionally, um, this webinar um, uh, will discuss the latest network security techniques. So um, uh, this webinar will feature three um, uh, legends actually from the industry. The first one will be Paul Brodsky, a senior analyst, uh, analyst uh, from the leading industry research firm, uh, Telegeography, who will be joined by Adam Davenport, the director of interconnection and strategy at GTT. And last but not least, Zamir Desai, the Director of Product Management at GTT. So we have a full, full agenda today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to talk to you about the internet bandwidth uh, trends, the pandemic impact, the advantage of a tier one ISP security best practices. And after the three sessions, as uh, uh, mentioned earlier, we're going to have, a, let's say, a 10, 15 minute um, a Q&A. So um, stay tuned with us. And uh, Paul, well, welcome and uh, over to you. The most famous word is you're muted. So <laughs> here we go. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction. I only thought of myself as a legend only in my own mind, but uh, it's appreciated that uh, uh, there's more to it than that. Um, uh, my name is Paul Brodsky, infrastructure analyst with Telegeography. I'm here in Washington, DC. Happy to be on the panel today. Um, slide, please. Um, as many of you know, Telegeography has been tracking the markets for uh, international bandwidth for many years. How many years? Exactly 20. This is our 20th anniversary in tracking uh, uh, international internet bandwidth. I just discovered that um, uh, the appropriate gift is emerald. So, you know, if you're just thinking of something for a gift, you know, for this, just an idea. Um, you know, back in 2001, when we first started tracking international bandwidth, the sum total of international bandwidth deployed uh, was a whopping 56 gigabits per second, which is remarkable if you if you think about it. Um, since then, the internet, uh, in terms of international bandwidth anyway, has has experienced inexorable growth, explosive growth, um, and to the point where this year in 2021, the total amount of international internet bandwidth deployed is over 750 terabits per second, which is just astonishing. Um, over the last several years, we have noticed a fairly steady trend in uh, marginal internet deployments. That is the amount of uh, additional internet bandwidth that is deployed between countries. And that rate of increase has hovered typically in the mid to high 20%. So if you see on this figure here, 2017, 2018, 2019, the rates of increase average about 25, 26, 27%. And then in 2020, COVID happened. And so much changed. Kids weren't going to school. They were taking school from home. Nobody was going to the office. People were working from home. Movie theaters were closed. People were entertaining themselves at home. Um, basically, every uh, that just there was a, there was an enormous increase in uh, in in uh, uh, in traffic demands on the internet. And so you can see in 2020 we see a bit of a a spike actually in the amount of bandwidth that operators deployed in order to accommodate this surge in demand. So you can see that little surge point up there in the year 2020, uh, whereas international growth rates had hovered in the mid to high 20s. In the year 2020, we saw a 34% increase 
and bandwidth deployed. Um, but that bump seems to be over. And the year 2021, we just completed our annual survey of uh, our annual accounting, if you will, of international internet bandwidth. And that number seems to have come back a bit. It's, it's backed off to about a 29% uh, growth rate from last year in um, uh, international internet bandwidth. Slide, please. Now, that's bandwidth. Let's look at traffic. It stands to reason that uh, increases in international bandwidth roughly coincide with increases in peak traffic as well. Network operators, uh, they want their networks to run not too hot, not too cold, it's a bit of a Goldilocks scenario. You run your networks too hot and you got congestion and other problems. You run your networks too cold and, you, and network operators are losing money on the equipment they deploy. So as you can see, again, from the years 2017, 2018, 2019, we see increases in peak traffic, again, hovering in the high 20s, maybe 30% um, in some years. Now look at that peak in 2020. Uh, peak traffic really went up in 2020, 48% measured uh, peak traffic increase from 2019 to 2020. So even though network operators threw a lot of bandwidth at, uh, in order to accommodate the increase in demand, the fact is that peak traffic went up even more than that. And the result, that networks ran a lot hotter in the year 2020. But again, we can see as with the increase in bandwidth deployments in 2021, the increase in peak traffic actually throttled back quite a bit in the year 2021. to so the point where we see a more normal increase, a more expected increase in the amount of, uh, of peak traffic. Um, so here we are. So things seem to have returned back to normal uh, in the year 2021. Slide, please. And operators didn't just add bandwidth in order to accommodate the surge in, in network demand. Um, in some ways, uh, networks ran a little bit smarter as well. Um, we, as, as part of our annual report, we surveyed several dozen uh, network operators, local operators, operators of regional networks, big tier one global backbone providers, we really tried to uh, get a sense across the board of just uh, what kind of initiatives were taken in order to accommodate the big increase in demand. And what we found is that 71% of the operators that we queried accelerated their increases of IP transit. So operators are always out there looking for uh, any increase in bandwidth, any increase in traffic, they need to purchase IP transit, many of them do. Um, but uh, a, a clear majority of them accelerated their planned purchases of additional IP transit. And the same thing with peering capacity as well. 85% of the networks that we queried accelerated uh, their, uh, their increases in their peering arrangements. And nearly 80% uh, of the network operators we queried accelerated uh, increases in caching capacity so that content, et cetera, can be simply can be accessed more readily right on their networks instead of having to go uh, uh, further, further out in order to retrieve content for their customers. Slide, please. Um, I think it's important to understand that the growth in international internet bandwidth is, is not uniform across, across the globe. The figures I showed before were global figures, but you know, different parts of the world experience things a little bit differently. Um, we are seeing that the highest growth rates of international bandwidth makes, you know, stands to reason happen in lesser developed regions. So Africa in particular stands out and enjoys the highest rates of, uh, of increase in internet bandwidth uh, over the last five years or so. Conversely, the Europe, Europe and the US, uh, which are much more mature markets, unsurprisingly, uh, have seen the slowest rates of increase in international bandwidth over the last five years. Still, even the US uh, had experienced uh, five-year compounded annual growth rates of well over 20% in international bandwidth. Slide, please. And you know, we're tall geography. We love uh, we love maps. We're never going to let you go without at least one slide showing a map of the world here. And we just want to point out that the U.S. and Europe remain really important hubs uh, for the global internet. Um, as you can see, the for Latin America in particular, the U.S. is a crucially important hub. Um, Seventy nine percent of all the international internet bandwidth deployed among Latin American countries actually connects through the US. And likewise, Europe is very much a hub for, uh, for the Middle East uh, and Africa. 83% um, of international internet bandwidth out of the Middle East is actually running to Europe. 
and 80% of international internet bandwidth out of Africa is connecting to Europe as well. Slide, please. Well, ultimately, I mean, end users uh, at the end of the day are what generate the internet traffic that network op operators have to carry. And there's really two factors to consider when we try to forecast just um, how much uh, bandwidth is going to be deployed into the future. Um, the first thing to consider is the forecasted growth of the number of end user subscribers, um, both mobile and fixed subscribers. And not only that, but secondly, the average amount of data used per subscriber. Um, currently, the majority of end user bandwidth is connected to fixed devices, even though there are far more mobile devices out there today than there are uh, fixed devices. But growth in total data usage looks like it's going to be driven not by increases in the total number of mobile or fixed subs, but by increases in the access speeds, particularly mobile access speeds going forward. Slide, please. So what's going to impact the growth of the public internet? Well, as I just mentioned, advances in access technologies, particularly 5G mobile, we think is going to be a big driver of traffic. I think history has demonstrated that if you provide more bandwidth to end users, clever developers and, uh, and consumers will find a way to use it. On the flip side, there are some trends that may actually retard the growth in international uh, uh, internet bandwidth. First of all, more and more enterprises are utilizing direct connections to cloud service providers for wide area networking. Um, in many cases, these direct connections bypass the public internet in doing so. Um, also, content caching takes pressure off of long haul internet links as well. Also, big over the top operators um, are deploying massive amounts of their own bandwidth for their own internal purposes, really. For example, connecting their own data centers. Um, and these connections, for the most part, tend to bypass the public internet. Um, but regardless, based on our quantitative analysis, as well as our qualitative surveys of network operators uh, of both major global and regional, even local ISPs, uh, we're finding that network operators are continuing to deploy additional amounts of bandwidth on their networks, albeit at, at pre-COVID levels. Um, and at that point, I'm happy to turn it over to Adam. Thanks, Paul. Um, so I'm Adam Davenport, uh, VP of IP Interconnection um, Operations and Engineering here at GTT. And uh, basically, I handle all things IP for GTT. Uh, so just a little bit about us. Uh, GTT is one of the largest tier one networks globally. Um, and as Paul mentioned, um, and yeah, hit on a minute ago, prior to the pandemic, our year over year uh, traf traffic growth rates, uh, right around the 25% range. Um, and then in March of last year, as the world began to shut down due to COVID, we began to see a huge spike in traffic across the GTT network. Um, globally, last March, we saw a sustained aggregate uh, traffic increase of roughly 10 to 12% in the course of just a few days. Um, this is half of the traffic growth we would normally expect to see in a full year. And again, we saw that in just a few days. Um, you know, after that initial jolt of new traffic last March, though, uh, traffic patterns definitely appeared to follow COVID trends. Um, we typically see a decrease in traffic over the summer, uh, but it was it definitely exaggerated last year as people started going back out in the summer months. Um, we also tr traditionally see an uptick of traffic going into the fall that continues on through the end of the year. And this too uh, was larger last year um, due, you know, due to COVID spiking again at the tail end uh, of the year last year. Um, in 2021, uh, we're seeing similar traffic patterns that continue to follow those COVID trends. Uh, as COVID rates uh, were decreasing late spring and early summer, our traffic patterns followed suit. Um, that trend continued as the Delta variant became prominent over the summer. And right now our traffic levels are a full 40% higher uh, than they were this time last year. Um, so, but in terms of where do we see traffic trends going, um, you know, as a network operator, uh, I'd love to see the trend of a hard up and to the right continue indefinitely. Um, I don't think that's sustainable, uh, but I would expect uh, based on, you know, what we've seen the last year and a half, uh, the traffic uh, trends to continue to kind of mirror what COVID is doing. And then hopefully once COVID settles down, we also see, you know, our traffic patterns uh, settled back down to that steady state of, you know, 25 to 29% year over year that we've traditionally seen. Uh, next, please. 
Um, so I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, the GTT is one of the largest tier one networks globally, uh, but what does that actually mean? Um, well, a tier one is largely uh, a marketing term, but the most basic definition of a tier one network is one that is completely transit free. Um, this means that a tier one does not buy IP transit from any other network. Uh, so a tier one reaches the entire internet via the sum of its downstream customers and settlement free peering partners only. So again, no transit. Um, not all, but most transit free tier ones generally operate at a global scale, which allows them to provide a consistent set of services and client experience throughout the world. Um, another byproduct of being a tier one is that your list of settlement free peering partners is generally pretty short. Um, and on the surface, having a short list of peering partners may sound like a bad thing, uh, but it's actually not. And that's typically because the list of directly connected customer networks is usually extremely long. Um, a large tier one network like GTT is typically able to deliver a packet in just an AS hop or two. And this is because of that extensive list of directly connected networks. Um, the scale uh, of a typical tier one also provides several advantages that I will hit here uh, in just one second. We can go to the next one. There we go. Um, so this is a map of the network, of the GTT network as it stands today. I'm sure pretty much everyone out there has seen similar maps from every provider they've ever interacted with. Uh, but we do have a couple of um, meaningful uh, highlights to, uh, to, to point out here. Um, GTT does have over 600 points of presence that span six continents. Uh, we service 260 cities across 140 different countries. Uh, and we also have over 220 terabits worth of edge IP capacity. Um, but one statistic that is not listed here that is definitely worth highlighting uh, is that we also have over 2,200 directly connected IP networks globally. Uh, the vast majority of those, uh, all but 30 or so, are actually customer networks or what we were, would consider our on-net routes. Uh, but because of this extensive on-net reach and scale, GTT is currently able to keep roughly 70% of all of our IP traffic completely within the GTT network. Again, 70% of all of our IP traffic stays within the GTT network and doesn't get handed over uh, to a peer. Um, this is absolutely huge because it allows us to retain full control of the path from where a bit enters our network and to where it ultimately exits. Um, and that happens uh, to be the vast majority of our traffic as well, again, 70%. Um, so for example, uh, let's say we have a packet that enters our network from a customer in Los Angeles and is destined to another customer in uh, Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, because that packet never leaves our network between LA and Frankfurt, we have absolute control over it. We can SLA and end latency if we need to. We can guarantee specific physical paths between the two locations if we need to. We can guarantee throughput between the two. Uh, but the most basic and probably most important is we can actually guarantee that the packet will get there. Um, if this packet was instead hopping through multiple networks, multiple peers, et cetera, uh, to get from A to Z, uh, without some sort of other intervention, uh, none of this would be possible to, to absolutely guarantee uh, in any way. Um, so as a result, uh, the practical advantages that come with the size and scale of being a tier one like GTT uh, simply can't be overstated. Um, next slide. And then uh, just a bit as a public service announcement, if nothing else, I, I would like to talk about uh, route-based security, specifically RPKI for, for just a moment. Um, a few times a year, you know, a lot of us will hear in the news uh, about widespread internet outages with extensive uh, negative impact. Um, some of these major events have historically been caused by accidental route leaks or even worse, intentional route hijacks. Um, at this stage, pretty much all upstream providers uh, place route-based filters on their downstream customers. It's just, it's pretty much a universal constant at this stage. Uh, but sometimes these filters are either configured incorrectly or a nefarious party is able to intentionally get something through that they otherwise wouldn't or shouldn't be able to. Uh, additionally, the way that these filters are placed and managed is a bit archaic and problematic at best. Um, there are currently two primary ways that these upstream filters are managed. Uh, the first, and still unfortunately all too common method, is completely manually. Uh, in this scenario, uh, upstream providers manually maintain filter lists on their downstream customers, and downstream customers provide a request uh, and often a written LOA in order to have these filters updated. 
Uh, the second popular method uh, is that filters are auto-generated off of data that is registered and made publicly available in an internet, internet routing registry uh, known as an IRR, i.e. You know, RAD, RADB. Uh, both methods have their problems though. Uh, with the manual, it's, uh, it's extremely easy for an LOA to be typoed or even worse, forged. And it's very easy for an upstream provider to unwillingly let it through. Uh, on the IRR side, uh, there's, uh, you know, IRR offers absolutely no uh, verification or validation as part of the registration process. Uh, anyone can literally register just about anything in IRR. And if the upstream provider isn't extremely diligent, things can and will get through. Um, but as a result, though, it's easy for a fat finger error or intentional bad actor to cause a lot of issues. Um, but this is exactly where RPKI comes in. So RPKI stands for Resource Public Key Infrastructure, and it provides a method for validating a legitimate owner of an internet resource number, uh, such as an IP address or autonomous system number or ASN, uh, it, um, it, that is, <laughs> it, sorry, uh, the R RPKI is used to validate uh, that the resource owner is indeed the legitimate owner um, of said resource. Um, with RPKI, uh, a legitimate holder of an asset can cryptographically sign what is called a route origin authorization or ROA with their regional internet registry or RIR, such as RIPE and ARIN. This ROA allows the resource holder to specify the route length, uh, which a given prefix should be announced on the open internet, along with the ASN the prefix should originate from, and even a date range for when it should be considered valid. Because this is done at the RIR level, it requires a legitimate asset holder to crypt cryptographically sign ROAs with the private key that corresponds with the public key that is linked to the customer submitting the ROA with the RIR. This all but ensures that the signer is indeed the legitimate asset holder and thus that the ROA is valid. Now, nothing is perfect. Um, private keys can always be compromised. But this is a huge step in the right direction for stopping unintentional route leaks and intentional route hijacks dead in their tracks. So within the last 24 months or so, a growing number of networks have implemented RPKI validation checks at their network edge. GTT was one of the first large tier one networks to implement this across its entire IP border. So all of our customers, all of our peers. Uh, and as of last May, uh, we've been rejecting uh, invalid RPKI routes across our entire network edge. This means that as long as an IP asset holder uh, has registered ROAS with their RIR, their assets are essentially route leak and hijack proof within networks like GTT that reject these invalids. So please, here's my PSA. If you are an IP asset holder, go register your ROAS with your RIR. And if you are a network operator, please consider implementing RPKI validation checks at your IP edge and reject those invalids. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to Samir to continue talking about network security as it pertains to DDoS. Samir. Thank you, Adam. So just picking up on the point that both Adam and Paul made earlier around a, a growth, uh, the, the, the trajectory growth in traffic and uh, the, the rising trends. Um, unfortunately, it's no big secret that we've also seen an accompanying rise in uh, threat, cyber threat activity, and in particular, distributed denial of service attacks, DDoS. Um, specific to DDoS attacks, we've seen all kinds of attacks on the rise, uh, different types of uh, DDoS vectors. Uh, they're all rising in terms of volume of traffic that they generate across the internet the complexity of attacks or multi-vector attacks, and also just as importantly, the frequency of those attacks. You know, we, we, we now routinely see DDoS activity that occur every few minutes, uh, let alone every day or, or every week, right? So it's that common now these days. Um, as well as in terms of the largest attacks, I mean, clearly we've, uh, here's the stat from 2020, we saw, uh, the largest attack is around about 2.3 terabits per second. Uh, however, that's becoming routine uh, as well. So just in the last two weeks ago, it's in, it's in the popular press. Uh, we're now seeing uh, on an average weekly basis, of, although the particular incident I'm thinking of is uh, multiple occasions when we've seen attacks above one terabits per second that's generated from a particular botnet called Mirai. So Mirai is a, is a malware 
that looks for and infects smartphones. So in this particular botnet, uh, I think it's about 30,000 smartphone compromised smartphone devices. So imagine a scenario, you have 30,000 smartphone devices that have clubbed together, that have been taken over, compromised, unknowingly by their owners, and they're generating uh, DDoS attacks above a terabit per second. So um, the, the stats as we as I see them, as you all see them, are you know phenomenal in that in that context. Next slide, please. Well, I can quote stats from the press, and, and clearly we see an increasingly regular uh, reporting in the popular press of the largest attacks ever. Um, however, our experience from a GTT as a as an internet service provider is actually what's what's going on that's unreported that's uh, below the waterline as it were of the iceberg um, low level volumetric attacks affect all our downstream customers uh, well not just our customers but every enterprise on a daily basis um, we've seen the vast majority of attacks and 95 percent are typically around 10 gig uh, per second and above the consequential impact of that is that those that activity that, that unwanted traffic that uh, that nefarious traffic clogs up bandwidth clogs up server capacity clogs up networking resources uh, and all of these resources or websites or all of these resources which could be utilized to support the enterprises legitimate business operations or uh, in, in some cases, mission critical activities, right? So um, it's true to say that DDoS is a, an unwanted threat that's here to stay, you know, it's on the rise. And as, as a tier one ISP, um, you know, it's our responsibility to uh, help pre prevent attacks from reaching our downstream customers. Also, the other point that we're seeing uh, is a lot of this DDoS activity is, uh, typically driven by organized criminal groups so uh, ransom uh, groups or organized um, you know groups that get together target businesses they they, they use ddos as part of a, an overarching ransom campaign where they exfiltrate data they sell off data as a separate revenue line as it were and then they hold that targeted enterprise for ransom and now these ransomware camp uh, these happen in waves so we, we we regularly see extortion campaigns uh with our downstream customers uh the last one i think of was what happened in may where a group calling itself avidon uh, uh, did a massive campaign right across europe north america and apac everyone were targeting financial the financial vertical right and the way these ransomware campaigns work is they target businesses they demand payment uh, unsurprisingly in bitcoin the amounts requested aren't particularly large uh, typically around the 30 to 40 thousand dollar mark but it's an amount that um, most businesses will gladly pay out because the impact of letting that attack the impact of that ransomware being success successful uh, will cause many times fold damage to that particular business right from a brand reputation um, point of view etc so uh, it's a problem next slide please so let's let me pick out some some stats here that sort of reinforces some of the points i've made previously um the nuisance factor around ddos is substantially increased so uh 86% of all attacks lasting only 10 minutes or less and can clearly uh, take that stat and also look at um, the 70% chance of that being a repeat attack. I mean, clearly they come together uh, uh, that, and, and that has consequences to the target business. Also, and you know, we talked about the pandemic earlier. Both Paul and uh, you know Adam alluded to it in their uh, in their bit. Uh, we've also seen because of the rise of remote and hybrid working associated with the pandemic, we've seen a phenomenal four hundred percent increase uh, in DDoS attacks that directly target VPN infrastructure. They're usually the bottleneck within an enterprise IT setup and 
that sort of stat combined with the fact that they're usually associated with extortion campaigns really means that uh, DDoS is, uh, and I hate to use the phrase, is a growing uh, revenue line. And it's a, it's a pretty large business uh, in itself. And you know, we, uh, as an ISP, clearly need to do something about it for the benefit of our downstream customers. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, we at GTT, we're focused on how we address and mitigate the impact of this frequently occurring low level, below the waterline attacks for our downstream customers. Um, the, the aim here is to provide essentially as near as we can get it, a clean pipe internet service to support our downstream customers, whoever they may be. And the way we do that is that we have plumbed in a dedicated DDoS detection and scrubbing capability directly into our tier one backbone as that graphic over there shows. Uh, the intent here is that we intercept DDoS traffic at our peering ingest points and note the point Adam mentioned earlier and that we are 100% you know, settlement free, uh, settlement free peering uh, network. We pick up traffic at our peering points. We intercept DDoS traffic on at, at that location, and we deal with it right there and then. And and the intent there is to then separate good from bad and allow legitimate clean traffic to then traverse our network and then ultimately end up at our downstream customers port. Um, we also provide a couple of modes of operation here from a DDoS scrubbing from a DDoS protection facility. You know, we operate a an all is on mode where the intent there is that we constantly 24 by seven uh, scrub inbound traffic, downstream traffic, um, so that uh, from a downstream perspective, you know, the, the, what they receive is always scrubbed, always relatively clean, always as clean as possible. And we also provide another mode where uh, some of our downstream customers, uh, particularly in the carrier community, uh, uh, need more of control, right? So the ability to redirect certain routes, certain IP flows onto uh, the scrubbing platform and the ability to, to let other types of traffic through, you know, for, for example, from a commercial proposition. So the combination of that all is on capability, which is that insurance, uh, you know, that insurance based guarantee of uh, peace of mind versus the flexibility come together with the GTT ISP tier one proposition that uh, Adam uh, talked about earlier. Next slide, please. So we're dealing with frequently occurring repetitive DDoS activities, right? So, and we're dealing with those uh, below the waterline daily attacks uh, clearly that needs more of an automated approach. So the all is on mode of mitigation that we automate and the whole intent of automation is to take out the, the human manual intervention, which not only adds time to the whole process, but also can be subject to error. And um, with the intention of stopping DDoS activity, uh, human intervention can potentially even uh, enhance an attack in, in some scenarios. Uh, the automation generated by dedicated platforms means that you know, we, we, we need to look out for uh, vectors that constantly change. Uh, DDoS attackers are quite sophisticated. They routinely change the way, uh, what method of DDoS attacks they use. They combine different techniques together uh, into multi-arm vector attacks. And clearly, as a aggregated sc uh, scrubbing capability, we've got to have automation within the rules that we use that look out for these types of attacks and respond to it, right? So that automation also needs to be tweaked to match a particular uh, downstream customer's traffic profile. So a, a managed host a downstream and that generates a lot of high bandwidth traffic will have a different traffic profile to say an enterprise customer downstream that obviously uses the internet for their day-to-day -day operations. So clearly the one size fits all approach with DDoS mitigation uh, clearly doesn't work uh, in many cases. And using automation, using dedicated technology and uh, enabling that uh, on a 24 by seven basis really comes together to kind of manage this ever-changing 
and growing DDoS landscape. It's, it's obviously important for ISPs to address the mitigation challenge well away from the downstream customer, right? So, so the, the, the unique combination here where, you know, we, we, we plumb in this uh, mitigation platform capability right on the edge, on the peering border of our network really helps to make sure that we don't end up carrying DDoS traffic unnecessarily. Uh, and more to the point, we, we, we ensure that that traffic doesn't reach our downstream port. Um, the other point to make here is that uh, there's a perception here that um, there's other ways to manage DDoS attacks. So um, firewall solutions with some element of DDoS protection built in or, or God forbid, you know, the, the use of black holing. Um, the trouble with enterprise security solutions, as I'll call it, so those integrated uh, security solutions that have DDoS uh, protection on the premise that they're not designed to respond to adaptive DDoS activity. So uh, remember the, the, the point I made earlier about sophisticated attackers that routinely change their attack vectors. They do it in a matter of seconds and minutes. So a typical static configuration on a managed security appliance sat in an enterprise data center will usually not do the trick and an attacker will usually find a way around it. Black holing, uh, although can be effective in some cases where you have obvious DDoS sources and obvious botnet with an obvious source IP, uh, could work for that. But in many cases, you're almost, to use a phrase, throwing the baby away with the bathwater. You know, sometimes you're, you're, you're actually enabling the attack on behalf of the DDoS attacker. So black holing is in itself not effective all the time. Next slide, please. So we made a point earlier, frequently occurring DDoS disruption or DDoS generated disruption, businesses that are adapting to an increasingly mobile or remote workforce, increased reliance on uh, internet accessible resources because everyone's hybrid or working from home, right? You bring on the impact of the pandemic and even before the pandemic came around, we've also had a situation where most of our most of the enterprise customers that we deal with, they're all moving their workloads, their applications into the cloud. So all that means that we have more and more services, applications and resources that are exposed to the internet. Uh, the traditional LAN is no longer relevant in, in, in the form it was originally designed for, right? You know, uh, stuff sits outside of a corporate enterprise network uh, and increasingly more these days. And also with the pandemic or accelerated with the pandemic, um, remote access infrastructure is in itself a legitimate target for a number of, for a lot of DDoS attackers, right? So all this means that uh, we've got this risk reward type positioning here in that, you know, that, that it's invariably shifting towards, in many cases, an always on DDoS mitigation posture. So, and, and not just that, but an always on capability that's backed up with automation, that's adaptable, that's sophisticated enough to change with the way attackers change their, their attack vectors. From a GTD standpoint, uh, probably three quarters of our DDoS mitigation base is on Olazon, right? I mean, it, 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 uh, the, the numbers that we have sort of, uh, you know, does the talking for us. You know, there, there's a huge amount of emphasis on making sure that where our enterprise customers or any one of our customers procure IP, they're looking for that clean pipe stamp in, in the RFP, for example, or in, in, the, in the sales engagement process. You know, we, we routinely talk about our DDoS protection and mitigation capability with our IP transit or DIA services, right? So look into the future, I guess, you know, we have other innovations. Um, Adam talked about a couple of things we're doing around our key, uh, our key RKPKI, I didn't say it probably, but there's other innovations coming through. Um, uh, FlowSpec, right, you know, that's that's been around for a while. Um, well, you know, there are, there's challenges with it clearly uh, right now, uh, but increasingly so, we're seeing um, 
ISPs adopting it in a more mainstream manner. You know, we, we're looking at it to some extent ourselves, uh, but this is all innovation designed to not, uh, to not only provide increasing amounts of internet bandwidth, but increasing amounts of secured internet bandwidth free of DDoS activity. Next slide, please. So let's sum up here. So we, we talked about what, what it means to be a tier one IP network, right? GTD is a tier one ISP. It's all about providing the capacity and a scale to not only deliver internet traffic, but also to manage large scale DDoS activity. We talked about uh, various um, service options or deployment modes with DDoS protection. So that one size uh, fits all approach, which we try and avoid. The all is on capability for that peace of mind of constant protection using dedicated platforms or hardware that minimizes latency. And we talked about the on-demand variant where, which allows for downstream control and flexibility of uh, you know, making sure that individual routes, individual um, target prefixes can be put under protection versus others that may be within that IP range. Um, we talked about the need for dedicated technology that's built into, plumbed into our core um, network, right? It's uh, based on industry, focused industry leading DDoS specific optimized technology uh, does things like deep, deep packet filtering, you know, aggregated analytics, et cetera, right? And, and ultimately uh, we also alluded earlier to the point about making sure that, you know, we, we're able to provide protection almost as an opt out, right? So uh, the conversations we increasingly have with our downstream opportunities is, uh, yes, you get secure internet access, and here's the reasons why, and here's the benefit of that, right? Uh, you know, sign here, please, type conversation. So it, it, all, it, all, it all points to an increasingly um, growing trend to uh, solution selling where DDoS protection is bol bolted into IP transit and DIA services going forwards. So... With that said, uh, let me hand back to Eric now, please. And I guess, Eric, how about we kick off the Q&A section? Thank you very much, Samir. Mm. But, but before I uh, kick off the, 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 the Q&A section, I firstly would like to, to thank you, Samir, Adam, and Paul for, 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 for sharing your impressive uh, knowledge uh, with, uh, with the audience. So, so thank you, all of the, the, the three of you. Thank you very much for that. Okay. So um, as Samir mentioned, um, uh, Kicking off the Q and A. Well, Zamir, you asked for it, so I come to you first. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were quickly um, talking about it because, um, uh, 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 given the increasing number of workers remotely accessing uh, uh, corporate network resources, are you seeing more DDoS attacks targeting the VPNs? Um, yes, we have been. Uh, we still do. Uh, since uh, we 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 seeing it twofold. So. We also provide uh, fairly scalable remote access infrastructure as part of the, the wider GDT portfolio. So along uh, as well as the point Adam made earlier around, you know, we saw a bump of pretty frenetic activity around internet access around about the start of the pandemic. We, we also saw a bump on VPN infrastructure sales, uh, solution sales. Uh, and as we then work through the pandemic and to date, we, we, we definitely see a sustained real rise in direct attacks that directly target VPN infrastructure, right? So we, uh, for, we, we do what we do to protect our VPN infrastructure uh, for our end users, uh, including our corporate users. So, so people like Adam and I don't get... Uh, you know, are protected. Uh, and clearly, you know, we, we see a lot of uh, th that approach with uh, our corporate customers as well, right? So, so the answer is yes, absolutely. You know, we, we see that growing, directly targeting VPN infrastructure. Okay, thank you very much, Samir. Um, Paul, to you, um, if I may, um, uh, to what extent will the development of 5G wireless network infrastructure drive the growth in, uh, in, in, in global IP traffic? 
Yeah, thanks, Eric. That's that's a good question. And I hate to say this, but no one's quite sure, right? Like it hasn't happened yet. Well, we've got some deployments out now, but it, it, I think it really depends on the applications that get that, that 5G accommodates. If, if, um, uh, if it's concentrated mostly in industrial applications, internet of things, these tend to be low latency, fairly small, uh, small bandwidth applications with traffic that runs to uh, some local like edge routers or edge, um, um, uh, edge data centers. It may not be a big bump in international bandwidth based on that, but again, as uh, I think history shows that if you, regardless of what it is, if you throw enough bandwidth at an end user, clever developers will come along and come up with some, who knows what kind of uh, perhaps consumer oriented or gaming applications that might be, um, uh, that might appeal to a large portion of the consumer populace, in which case that may actually uh, have a, uh, an impact on, on long haul bandwidth. So it remains to be seen uh, just what kind of applications get built around uh, 5G deployments. Um, I'm happy to have any of the other panelists uh, chime in with their, their, their perspective on this. Okay, Adam, you wanna chime in on yeah. this one? Thanks. Yeah, just real quickly, I think the only thing, uh, you know, potentially worth adding is, you know, over the last couple of years, we've seen a push for the, the content guys, the CDNs, et cetera, to actually deploy in cell towers directly, which, you know, completely eliminates mm -hmm. that, that long haulness uh, that could be, um, you know, that would otherwise, uh, you know, be present. So, you know, as, as that continues to expand, you know, I think Paul hit the nail on the head is it's, it's too early to tell. Okay, thank you so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, whenever you're an ISP, a carrier, reseller, CDN, cloud provider, multinational company, or other type of business that relies on fast and secure IP connections around the world, um, uh, we hope you learned um, um, uh, from the insightful uh, session centered uh, on the world's most critical communication vehicle, which is called the internet. So, um, I would like to thank Paul very much thank you very much paul for for your contribution and sharing your knowledge as always an honor having you thank you so much uh adam cool to have you as well and uh and and always interesting whatever you have to say to the audience so thank you very much and zamir uh last but not least but um uh thank you so much for uh for, for, for sharing your thoughts your ideas and your knowledge with uh, with everybody around the world so and with this ladies and gentlemen I would like to uh, uh, say once more, we were talking about how to improve your IP traffic performance and security, and you were listening to the sponsored webinar of, uh, of uh, GTT uh, on the key trends, the challenges, and, and the strategies. And whenever you want to get involved with these guys, do it and, uh, and drop them a call because they're ready for you out there to help and to support you. So with these words, uh, again, a big thank you to you, um, uh, Paul, Adam, and, and Zamir. Um, uh, the audience, thank you so much. And then over back to the studio, uh, to Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Dear all, we are at the end of this webinar session. And I would like to, again, thank you, Paul, Samir, and Adam for the interesting presentation and our audience for participating and listening. This panel will be soon available to watch on CC Media Portal. We are looking forward to welcoming you in our both physical and virtual events this year. For more information, please visit our events portal. If you're interested in supporting and sponsoring one of our future branded webinars, contact CC team. For all updates and fresh content, follow us on, on our four social media channels. Also subscribe to our Telegram news channel to receive exclusive invitations to the CC webinar live session. That's all for today. Goodbye.